Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel and uh, today we are diving into the world of data engineering but it's not a typical learn these five tools or, or follow this roadmap kind of video, no. As you might know, I'm Josh and I'm a senior software engineer at DoorDash working on different data and AI enabled products and before that I was an AI engineer at Google and let's be honest, data engineering as a field it's not easy, it is super challenging because there are a lot and lots of things to learn. Today we are going to talk about 7 different problems or hard truths that people face when they are starting out and learning data engineering, starting from which programming language to choose, to handling like mental burdens when you are learning a lot of new things at the same time. These 7 different truths will not only enable you to start learning data engineering but kind of equip you with the right tool set if you want to become an expert down the line. But before we jump right in, do not forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel and once you've done that, let's get to it. Number one, spaced repetition. So this technique helped me a lot when I was like new to data engineering and maybe I was preparing for different types of interviews. Data engineering has so many tools. I mean, it has orchestration tools, it has ETL, ELT tools, it has cloud platforms. Within a cloud platform, you have tons of tools. You need different programming languages and then you also need to learn SQL and data modeling and Spark and then the list goes on, right? So it can kind of get overwhelming and it's very common that if you study about, let's say, Spark right now for like two, three weeks and then you pick up SQL and Python and all that, and after about a month, if you again, somebody asks you about Spark, you will not remember as many things as you did when you started out, right? This is also called Ebbinghaus Learning Curve, which is named after a psychologist. The amount of things that you keep in your memory kind of decreases over time. And like, for example, at immediate level, when you have just read or learnt it, it's obviously at 100%. But even after about one hour, it drops down to less than 50%. And if you look at around one to two days, it has dropped down to nearly 33%, which is really surprising. So to avoid this problem, you need to revise everything at an increasing interval. So for example, you learn something and then you do a revision after day one and then you do the next revision after day three, you do the next one after day seven and so on and so forth. Maybe something like a Fibonacci series revision could help here. This technique, what you need to do is you need to apply whenever you are preparing for interviews as well. Now, second one, I have had so many different questions like what programming language should I learn or what cloud platform should I work on? There is only one answer to all these three questions and that is it does not matter. Well, let's take an example of learning a programming language. So it doesn't matter whether you learn Python or whether you learn Java or whether you learn Golang or Kotlin or, you know, tons of other programming languages. What's important is that you understand the algorithms and the patterns which are most asked in the interviews. Most of the companies in which you apply and you have a technical interview in which you need to do some coding, they don't really care which programming language you choose. I remember in my coding days, I was really good at Java because that was the only programming language language that I knew. So I did all of my competitive coding practice in Java uh, to learn DSA and everything. But right now, if somebody asks or even shows me a simple code in Java, I won't be able to interpret that quickly because I need something to refer to. Maybe I'll do a lot of Google searches, which is fine. Python is generally a good programming language to start for beginners because it's so easy and it's almost like reading English. And there are also so many data libraries supported. So it's good for data engineers. So that's what I generally recommend. But if you like something other than Python, it's completely fine. You can stick to it. And same thing, as I said, it applies to SQL as well. It doesn't matter whether you learn PostgreSQL or MySQL or SQL Server. The concept of SQL remains the same. A lot of people ask me that, hey, which cloud platform should I choose? Which orchestration tool is the best? Which messaging service is the best? You can choose AWS plus Airflow plus Kafka. And you can choose something like GCP and Dataflow and uh, PubSub, it doesn't matter. As long as you pick one and learn it fully, you can easily transfer that knowledge to something else. When it comes to learning system design or be it DSA, I wholeheartedly recommend Geeks for Geeks. For example, you can see the premium subscription that I have and it comes with over 50,000 rupees worth of courses 
for free there are different sections like for dsa machine learning data science for example once you click on this python course you can see that it starts with the analysis of algorithm starts with all the data structures all kinds of algorithms you understand the math behind it you can also directly click on problems for example within system design i was looking at this introduction to queuing systems video and it talks about all the diagram where in your data pipeline or in your application you use a queuing service and how does it work in the back end it's not just about system design or dsa for example within machine learning and data science and learn about the latest and greatest generative AI. Now this course itself as you can see it's for five weeks. You also see the Jupyter notebook code snippets and you can actually run them, do hands-on and go crazy with it. Uh, even in this section, you can see different quiz and MCQs. You get ad-free access of geeks for geeks and you get 24 seven live chat support. If you're stuck on a problem, you can reach out and an expert will assist you. There's also an AI bot and a text summarization feature. Annual subscription is the best value because in that you also get one year free. You will not regret it. I'd like to thank geeks for geeks for sponsoring this. Now back to our video. Number three, not a lot of YouTubers will tell you this, but the key to learning data engineering is stop watching YouTube and start doing. So for example, if you are good at, uh, if you know that, hey, I'm not so good at DSA or if I'm not so good at SQL, aim to solve 100 problems in next three months, which is very manageable, right? I mean, you have to solve about one problem per day. And I'm pretty sure if you take it up for the first time, it is going to be hard. Let's assume that you did a first iteration of 100 problems and you solved like 50 of them, it is fine. You do another iteration, but now because you have experience of 50 problems already in your arsenal, somehow you will be able to solve maybe 20 or 30 more questions when you do another iteration out of the questions that you were not able to solve. Again, you do a third iteration, maybe you'll be able to solve 10 more. And it's possible that in fourth iteration, you're not able to solve anything new. It is fine. I mean, you're not expected to solve 100% of the problems, but it's important that you review and compare where you were stuck versus what solution that people have submitted and then compare it and see what was missing. So the key is you need to stop taking advice or something. You just need to start doing get your hands dirty, do hands on. And this applies to learning system design as well. So when it comes to data engineering, system design is not about building an application. Most of the times it's about building a data pipeline. So in order to be good at system design in data engineering, you need to build some of the data pipelines on your own. And that is the single best way to learn versus reading a book like designing data intensive application, doing it on your own will always give you way more learning. Try to aim for at least a couple of data pipelines on your own and then host it on GitHub, put it on your resume, right? It will also increase your visibility. Go through reference architecture. So AWS, for example, have so many reference architectures. The more of them you go through, the better you'll become. So the key is stop watching and just start doing, get your hands dirty. Do mock interviews maybe with your friends and colleagues who can help you out and then ask for their feedback how you're doing on something. I also have a top mid page in which I've taken so many different mock interviews and help people assess that where they are depending on their existing skill level and provided a detailed feedback. So if you want to do that, I'm going to link it in the description as well. Hard work. So I, I learned a musical instrument called tabla, which is like an Indian classical musical instrument. And it requires a lot of discipline and hard work to learn that. And I've given almost all possible exams of that instrument, which took me over 10 years. So learning something like coding or SQL or even data modeling, it can take a long time. It's like learning a musical instrument. You will fail at it in the beginning, but then you need that discipline, that perseverance to keep at it. In my experience, when it comes to any job in software engineering, yes, talent matters. There are people who are really naturally good at solving puzzles who do perform better in DSA. But in 90% of the times, hard work will always beat talent, no matter what. Now, next point, since we talked about hard work, it's also important to talk about something which is like at the opposite end of it. So most of the time, data engineers or anybody who works in the software industry, they'll end up working, spending like most of their day in front of the computer. And that is naturally not healthy for human bodies. I mean, we are not meant to be sitting in front of a computer. Our bodies are meant to move. So we need to exercise as much as possible. So don't forget to like, even if that's as simple as walking, don't forget to exercise and don't forget to take breaks. Uh, maybe probably you can take a break after having 25 or 30 minutes of deep focused work or deep focused learning. Take a break of five to 10 minutes. It's completely okay. It will help you keep productive and it will ensure that you don't burn out because yes, 
in the last point i told you that you need a lot of hard work but at the same time you don't want to burn out your productivity will decrease over time for example you ran into an error in your pipeline that you just cannot figure out and you are you have been sitting in front of your computer to fix it for like 3 hours 4 hours or maybe even late in the night and it's just not striking to you well that is the best time it's a best reminder that you need to take a break because your mind is not able to think of any think of look at a problem from any new angle do something else maybe follow your hobby um, sleep for some time and then the last topic human brains are wired to go after rewards for example there was a monkey experiment done that how our brains are very similar to our ancestors as well and that's why we are so addicted to casinos group of monkeys were kept in a room and there was a light in the room and when the light would come up they would get a reward maybe something like a banana the dopamine level were the max when the light came up that was in the anticipation of a reward and versus when they got a banana dopamine level kind of decreased so that was surprising that reward is not giving you dopamine but the anticipation of reward is giving you more dopamine that's how our human brains are kind of wired so why not use that to our advantage we need to create smart goals for that smart is like an abbreviation so what does that means if you set a goal like hey i want to be better at data engineering that's not a good goal that's not specific enough if you set a goal like i want to be better at sql while that is specific it's not measurable and if you set up a goal like uh, i want to solve 20 lead code problems within a day while that goal is specific it is measurable but it's not achievable i want to be better at sql and then i'll be solving one lead code problem in a given day now that is a smart goal it is measurable it is specific it is achievable as well it is time bound and it is relevant to data engineering the smaller the goal the better because the moment you check it off it will give you that dopamine hit and it will make sure that you do your task as fast as possible so that's it we covered all seven different hard truths that you need to know before you start learning data engineering and i hope this video helped you out if it did don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you have your thoughts maybe something else that you do that helps in your learning process and you want to discuss let's drop it down in the comment section let's talk about it thank you so much for watching this video see you next time